Why do mothers take the lives of their children? In this video, we're going to look at two cases where mothers did the unthinkable. We're going to start with the case of Tierra Gobble, which took place in the state of Alabama. For the purposes of this story, I'm just going to refer to the suspect as Gobble, for obvious reasons. On December the 15th, 2004, Gobble's four-month-old son, Phoenix, was rushed to the emergency room of the Southeast Alabama Medical Center in Dotham. He was not breathing and he had no pulse. Attempts to resuscitate him were unsuccessful and he was pronounced dead shortly after he was brought to the hospital. The autopsy showed that Phoenix died as a result of blunt force trauma to his head. Phoenix's skull had been fractured. Phoenix had numerous other injuries including fractured ribs, a fracture to his right arm, fractures to both wrists, multiple bruises on his face, head, neck and chest and the inside of his mouth that was consistent with the bottle having been That's disgusting. How dare you treat a child like that? Gobble gave birth to Phoenix on August 8, 2004 in Plant City in Florida. The child was taken from her custody by the Florida Department of Children and Families, also known as DCF, within 24 hours after his birth because of the DCF's involvement with Gobble's first child, Jewel, who was 18 months old at the time of Phoenix's death. Jewel had been removed from Gobble's custody in December 2003 by the Florida Department of Children and Families and placed with her paternal uncle, Edgar Parrish. At the time of Phoenix's death, Gobble was under a court order to have no contact with her children. However, Gobble and her boyfriend Samuel David moved in with Phoenix, Parrish and Walter Jordan in October of 2004. Gobble signed an affidavit stating her intent to terminate her parental rights. She didn't even want the baby. In the early morning hours of December the 15th, 2004, Gobble was having trouble getting Phoenix to go to sleep because he was fussing. Ooh, that's what kids do, you muppet. At around 1am, Gobble went to feed him. After he finished his bottle, she put him back in his crib. At around 9am, Gobble checked on Phoenix and found him playing. Gobble went back to sleep and woke approximately 11am. When she went to check on Phoenix, she discovered that he was not breathing. Gobble called Jordan, who was also in the trailer that morning. Jordan went to get Parrish, who was nearby. Parrish returned to the trailer and telephoned emergency 911. When paramedics arrived, Phoenix was unresponsive and they rushed him to a local hospital. Dr. Jonas Salney, the emergency room doctor who treated Phoenix at the Southeast Alabama Medical Center, testified that Phoenix had bruises, contusions on his face, scalp and chest. They were everywhere, he said. The x-rays showed that Phoenix had a skull fracture, fractures to both wrists and fracture to his right upper arm. The doctor testified that it takes quite a bit of trauma and quite a bit of force to fracture a skull. The autopsy report admitted by agreement of the parties showed that Phoenix also had fractures to several of his ribs. Dr. Salney testified that Phoenix would have been in tremendous pain from any of the numerous injuries. Officer Tracy McCord of the Houston County Sheriff's Department testified that Gobble was taken into custody several hours after Phoenix was taken to hospital and was questioned by police. Gobble told McCord that she was Phoenix's primary caretaker, even though Parrish was his guardian, and that she would occasionally get frustrated with him when he would not go to sleep. She said she could have broken his ribs from holding him too tightly, and that when she was holding Phoenix, she leaned down in the crib to get his blanket quickly, and Phoenix's head might have struck the side of the crib at the time. Tori Jordan testified that she had known Gobble for about two and one half years, and that she had periodically babysat for Jewel over a period of about five months. She said that Gobble had told her that if she couldn't have her children, nobody else could. Gobble testified in her own defense and portrayed Hunter as abusive and domineering. She also testified that she was the primary caretaker for the children, that she was under a court order to not be around her children, and that several days before his death, she noticed that Phoenix had bruises on his body but she said she did not do anything because she was scared. Gobble further testified that she was the only person to have contact with Phoenix for the 10 hours immediately preceding 
his death. She did not telephone 911 when she realized he was not breathing because she did not want to get into trouble. During her cross-examination, the state introduced a letter written by Gobble in which she wrote that she was responsible for Phoenix's death. In the letter, Gobble writes, It's my fault, my son died, and that she didn't mean for it to happen. Eventually, in 2005, Gobble was sentenced to death. Some of you comment and say, if you're going to do this to children, why have them in the first place? I think that applies to Gobble's case. She hated children. She just wanted to be free. To do what? I don't know. But she hated the responsibility. She loathed it. Every time she looked at her kids, she was filled with rage. Like, think about it. If a child is being fussy and is trying to go to sleep, it's okay to get a little frustrated. But when you take it to that extreme level of abusing that child, that's when you see the child as an inconvenience. The death sentence, probably the lightest thing that could have happened. Now I'm going to go on to the case of Genevieve Garcia in the state of Illinois. She was charged in the murder of her husband. But during the investigation, she revealed how she took the life of her daughter. So I'll start with that and then I'll get back on to the husband. Garcia told police in 1977 that her 11-month-old daughter, Sarah Swan, had accidentally suffocated on a plastic clothing bag. Fire department paramedics took the girl to Ravenswood Hospital, where doctors tried to revive her but failed. But in 1981, Garcia was charged with the murder of the infant and also with four counts of arson for setting fires in three northwest side Chicago apartment buildings. Two of those fires occurred in the building where she lived in the month following her baby's death. The other two fires were in buildings where she lived near the time of the third and fourth anniversaries of the death. In 1981, Garcia told police investigating the arsons that she could lead them to the grave of a prostitute who had been killed by her pimp. She took police to a cemetery plot in the southwest suburbs, but when investigators checked cemetery records, they discovered that the plot was occupied by Garcia's deceased daughter. Following an investigation, she admitted killing her daughter and setting the fires. She pleaded guilty in 1982 in Cook County Circuit Court. She was sentenced to 20 years in prison and she was released on parole in March of 1991. Now, four months later, in July of 1991, Genevieve was at her grandparents' home drinking alcohol on the porch. She was with her uncle, Tom Cooty, her ex-boyfriend, Mike Garber, and her new boyfriend, John Gonzalez. Having left for a while, Gonzalez later returned to the Genevieve residence and she left with him early the next morning, July 23rd, 1991, around 12.15 a.m. They drove to Gonzalez's place of work where he learned that he was too late for his shift and that his replacement had arrived. They then went to Genevieve's bank to retrieve money but they were unsuccessful. Genevieve then directed Gonzalez to drive to Bensonville where her ex-husband was living. Though she did not tell Gonzalez exactly where they were heading or whom she intended to see. She merely stated that she knew where she could get some money. Upon arriving at the parking lot of her ex-husband's apartment building, Genevieve saw him and said hello. She grabbed Gonzalez's 357 Magnum pistol, which was between her and Gonzalez in the front seat. She got out of the car and forced her ex-husband to turn around and get into his pickup truck. While seated in the truck, an argument immediately ensued during the course of which was allegedly a struggle for the gun. Guinevere then shot the victim at point-blank range one time in the chest. He staggered out of the truck and fell onto the pavement where he bled to death. Before leaving the scene, she took the keys to his truck. According to Gonzalez, the entire incident in the truck lasted about 30 seconds. When Guinevere returned to the car, she told Gonzalez, that motherfucker deserved to die. Genevieve drove Gonzalez's car from the murder scene back to her grandparents' house in Chicago. During the drive, Genevieve discarded the empty shell casing out of the window. After she arrived home, she commenced calling the victim's answering machine 
starting at 3.39 a.m. Why do you think she was calling the answering machine? She's obviously trying to cover her own tracks. Make it seem like I was trying to get a hold of him. I don't know what happened. In the course of these calls, Genevieve left messages for George expressing her love for him. Throughout the early morning, Genevieve continued to drink. Later that morning, after the Bensonville Police Department learned of the murder, Genevieve and Gonzalez came voluntarily to the Bensonville Police Department to answer some questions. Genevieve's uncle, Tom Cootie, drove the car. During the trip, Genevieve allegedly consumed four beers. Upon reaching the police department at approximately 8.15 a.m., Genevieve answered questions until she left the station around 12.30 p.m. Now, I'm going to go into what happened during the questioning. What do you think she did? Do you think she confessed? Or do you think she said, I don't know? Or is there a third option? What do you think that third option is? During the course of her answers, Genevieve voiced several times that she wanted to get the person responsible for her husband's death. She also told her uncle that she believed John Gonzalez was the killer. Do you think she would pin it on John? Genevieve and Gonzalez left the police station and headed home to Chicago. During the ride home, Genevieve consumed two or three more beers. Several hours after arriving home, Genevieve and Gonzalez went to the Beehive Lounge to have some drinks. An hour or so after arriving at the Beehive Lounge, Genevieve telephoned the Bensonville police from a payphone and stated that Gonzalez had just told her that he had killed her ex-husband so he could have Genevieve all to himself. You see how manipulative she was? She murdered her husband and she pinned it on her boyfriend. Silly cow. Genevieve pretended to be overcome with grief and anger. Both Genevieve and Gonzalez were arrested and read their Miranda warnings. The Bensonville police told Genevieve she was not really under arrest, but to go along with the ruse for Gonzalez's sake. They were both then taken to the Bensonville police station. At 6pm, Genevieve was again issued Miranda warnings. She signed a card indicating that she read and understood her rights and proceeded to give a handwritten and tape-recorded statement to the police stating that Gonzalez had killed her husband. In a separate room, Gonzalez told police that it was Genevieve who had shot the victim. At 10.30pm, Genevieve was informed that she was under arrest for the murder of her ex-husband, George Garcia. She was once again issued Miranda warnings, which she understood, and then produced a written confession admitting that it was she and not Gonzalez who had shot her ex-husband. This silly cow, obviously she's tipsy or she's drunk, murders her husband, pins on her boyfriend, and she's like, oh, oh yeah, uh, it was me. And in the previous story, where she took the life of her daughter, this woman is a real piece of work. Several hours after Genevieve's confession, she was processed by Officer Newberg at the Bensonville Police Station. Genevieve was shaking, thus making it difficult for Newberg to fingerprint her. Newberg asked why she was shaking and Genevieve answered that she had just shot her ex-husband. Newberg then asked Genevieve what kind of gun she had used and where she had gotten it, to which Genevieve answered it was a 357 Magnum and that she had gotten it from a friend. Prior to her trial for first degree murder and unlawful use of a firearm by a felon, Genevieve moved to suppress her statements and confession. She argued that she was too intoxicated to knowingly and intelligently waive her Miranda rights. Additionally, Genevieve sought to suppress the statements made in response to Officer Newberg's questions because her Miranda warning, if valid, had gone stale. As well as being a silly cow, she's a moron. The trial court denied all these motions because Genevieve waived her right to have a jury impose her sentence, wishing only to have a jury for the guilt phase of the trial. The trial court allowed only seven preemptory challenges instead of 14, to which Genevieve objected. At trial, various persons testified. In addition, Genevieve attempted to introduce the contents of the conversation between her and her ex-husband before she shot him to establish that she killed him while under a sudden and intense passion resulting from an intense provocation. The trial court, however, refused to allow her to testify as to the victim's words. This muppet, she thought, oh, if I pretend there was some kind of struggle, maybe I can get away with it. Not knowing you can't speak on behalf of someone that's dead, let alone the person you killed. Uh. Genevieve was, however, allowed to testify as to the words she spoke in the conversation. 
as well as about the alleged physical altercation between Genevieve and George as they struggled over the gun. The state called three witnesses. They were Simon Falacasa, the former husband of Genevieve, Detective George Graham of the Chicago Police Department, and Terry Shiganos, formerly an assistant state attorney in Cook County. Now, Falacasa's testimony was important. He said that he and his girlfriend at the time were the victims of an armed robbery by Genevieve, during which Genevieve and an accomplice tied them up and he was pistol whipped by Genevieve. Genevieve was subsequently convicted of robbery and sentenced to probation. Detective Graham testified that he was assigned to the Bomb and Arson Division of the Chicago Police in the late 1970s. He investigated and eventually solved, in 1981, four aggravated arsons set by Genevieve and the homicide of her 11-month-old daughter. She burned her daughter, who was only 11 months. Lock her in a room, throw away the key. The child's cause of death had been ruled accidental, suffocation four years earlier because Guinevere had told the police that her daughter had been left alone in a room where she wrapped herself around a plastic bag and suffocated. On a separate note, why on earth are you leaving your 11-month-old in a room alone? In 1981, however, Guinevere confessed to the murder of her daughter and the four aggravated arsons. The confession was transcribed in the presence of Graham and Shiganos, the transcript of which was considered by the sentencing judge in this case. The trial court determined that Genevieve was eligible for the death penalty. In mitigation, Genevieve presented evidence which showed that she suffered from depression, alcoholism and borderline personality disorder. Is that another word to say wanker? Also, it was shown that Genevieve had been sexually abused by an uncle from six years old up through her early teens. Finally, Genevieve presented testimony evidencing her good behavior while in custody for the instant murder trial. In support of her contention that she was too intoxicated to knowingly and intentionally waive her Miranda rights, Genevieve recounts the nature and quantity of alcohol she consumed prior and subsequent to her ex-husband's death. This is how she explained it in more detail. Genevieve said that she started drinking with John Gonzalez around noon on July the 2nd, 1991. At 12.15 the next morning, Genevieve and Gonzalez went to Gonzalez's job and learned that he had been replaced because he was late. They then decided to get some money and continue their drinking. When their attempts at the cast station failed, Genevieve then decided that she should drive from Chicago to Bensonville so that she could get some money from her ex-husband. Upon arriving at her husband's apartment complex, they observed him getting into his truck. She got out of the car with Gonzalez's gun and got into the truck with her ex-husband. After shooting him, Genevieve got into the car and drove herself back to Chicago. Upon arriving there, she allegedly continued drinking through the night. Her uncle, Tom, observed her in what he deemed an intoxicated state at 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. later that day. After Genevieve told him that her ex-husband had been shot and this was confirmed by the Bensonville Police Department, Tom drove Genevieve and Gonzalez to the Bensonville Police Station. On the way to the police, Genevieve allegedly consumed four more beers. They arrived at the Bensonville Station at approximately 8.15 a.m., where Genevieve remained voluntarily till 12.30. During her time at the station, Genevieve did not have anything to drink. On the way back to Chicago from the station, Genevieve consumed two or three additional beers. Upon arriving at her house in Chicago, Genevieve had some coffee made by her uncle. Mid-afternoon, Genevieve and Gonzalez decided to go to the Beehive Lounge. While there, they consumed a series of $2 screwdrivers, which is known as vodka and orange juice. The exact amount consumed by Genevieve is uncertain. However, Genevieve estimates that she and Gonzalez drank $30 worth of these drinks based upon the amount of money she had left upon her subsequent arrest. An hour or so after their arrival at the Beehive Lounge, Genevieve called the Bensonville police and fingered Gonzalez as the murderer. Shortly thereafter, at approximately 4.30pm, Genevieve and Gonzalez were arrested by the Bensonville police. Genevieve was also told at this time that she was really not under arrest 
and that she could go along with the ruse for the sake of Gonzalez. One and a half hours after her arrest at 6pm, Genevieve was again issued Miranda warnings, after which she gave a tape, recorded and handwritten statement to the Bensonville police. These statements implicated John Gonzalez in the murder of her ex-husband. But four hours later, at 10.30pm, Genevieve was placed under arrest for the murder. She was then again issued Miranda warnings, after which she provided a second statement in which she confessed that it was her, and not John, who had shot her husband. Now, after the close of all the evidence, the jury was instructed on first-degree murder, second-degree murder, and involuntary manslaughter. The trial court refused Genevieve's tendered non-Illinois patent jury instruction that a voluntary act is a material element of every offence. The jury convicted Genevieve of first-degree murder and the court convicted Genevieve of unlawful use of a firearm on July 27, 1992. Genevieve's motion for a new trial was denied in September of 92. Then, an eligibility and sentencing hearing took place on October 7, 1992. Eventually, in October of 92, Genevieve was sentenced to death. But she was then eventually commuted to life in prison. Let's break this down. She murdered her daughter, God knows why. She then murdered her ex-husband, probably because she was mad at him or she was drunk or something. Then she tried to pin it on John Gonzalez. But let me take you back to the initial drinking session she had with Tom and John. She was there with her ex-boyfriend Mike. What the fuck is that? Uncle, boyfriend, ex-boyfriend. What kind of triangle is that? There's no mental illness here. This is just someone who was an idiot. Some people are best left unexplained. May she never be released. 